Good morning, good afternoon and good evening everyone. Today we're going to have our head in the clouds because in this Citrix Comfort session I'm going to tell you everything you ever wanted to know about monitoring Citrix Cloud. Uh, my name is Elton van Gulik and as you might have guessed from my accent and my pronunciation, I'm from the Netherlands. I'm one of the 46 worldwide CTPs and I work for a Dutch company called Rawworks, where I'm the principal consultant for the workspace domain. Uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, today we're going to talk about monitoring Citrus Cloud. The key to maintaining every good CFAT environment is monitoring. Uh, because how else can you know what's going on in your environment when your users start calling up with issues like I can't really access my VDI and such. Uh, and since this is a Citrix Converge session, which is of course geared towards developers, we're going to do things a little bit different than uh, normally. And we're going to focus the monitoring on of the environment on monitoring with OData and with PowerShell. So we'll start off with what PowerShell is. PowerShell is a task automation and configuration management framework from Microsoft, consisting of a command line interface and an associated scripting language. Initially a Windows component only, known as PowerShell, it was made open source uh, and cross-platform in August 2016 with the introduction of PowerShell Core. Um, the former is built on the .NET framework and the latter is built on .NET Core. Uh, small trivia for you guys. Uh, did you know that Microsoft started working on PowerShell way back in 2002 and it was called Microsoft Monad back then? ISL didn't. So, OData. What is OData? OData was in, coincidentally also developed by Microsoft in 2007 and it allows for the creation and consumption of queryable RESTful APIs in an easy to consume and standardized way. Uh, in that regard, OData has some similarities with ODBC. Uh, because in a sense, OData provides the middleware between producers and consumers of data. Technically speaking, OData is based on RESTful HTTP services. So what is REST then? REST is also an acronym and it stands for Representational State Transfer, or RESTful Web Services. And they are a way of providing interoperability between computer systems on the internet. Uh, REST compliant web services allow for requesting systems to access and manipulate textual representations of web resources using a uniform and predefined set of stateless operations. RESTful implementations make use of a lot of standards like HTTP, URI, JSON or XML. So, now that we got all the boring definitions out of the way, let's talk a little bit about Citrix Director. Um, since the introduction of XNAP and XNAP Sub 7, uh, Director is the default and standardly included monitoring tool for CVET environments. Uh, Citrix Director is a console that provides you monitoring troubleshooting uh, capabilities and Director can access real-time data from the broken agent using unified console and integrate it with uh, historical trends and some basic networking analysis. Let's take a quick look at the Citrix Director console, just to get some basic understanding of what we're working here uh, before we dive into coding. Uh, we can easily access Citrix Director uh, console from the main Citrix Cloud page under the hamburger menu, services, query apps and desktops, next to the management buttons. And just like with the on-premises version of Citrix Director, uh, if you open the view, you get started with the real-time console. And as you can see here, we have one filled desktop machine and we have a whopping one active session at the moment. Yeah, this is not a very busy moment uh, environment at the moment. Um, from here, we can also launch uh, some trends, uh, the number of current sessions, uh, failures, uh, logon performance, uh, evalu uh, a load evaluator index, machine usage, and much, much more. We can also set up some basic alerts. I set alerts, one to the right, I'll show. Yeah, we can also set up some basic alerts and we can also export our data. It took me a while to find the export button, but here we go. So to access the data from the monitoring database with PowerShell and OData, we first need to authenticate. Um, the first step in authenticating ourselves is to go and set up an API access to the Citrix Cloud environment and to get a uh, API key and secret value pair. And we can do that underneath the Identity and Access Management, here we find the API Access tab. We also will need the Customer ID, so let's make sure that we write that down as well. And let's create a client. Um, let's name our client and click Create Client. 
There we go. And here we have our client ID and secret. Please note down the ID and the secret because this will be the only time that you can see the secret value. So make sure you write this down. Oh yeah, and for all you small Alex out there, I've deleted the API uh, ID and secret uh, pair right after I recorded this video. So you won't be working with these anymore if you get any smart IDs. So once we've written this down, we can go to the next step. Now that we got our API access sorted, which was the first step in authenticating ourselves, we need to create a so-called bearer token. And this is because Citrix, uh, the Citrix APIs work with uh, uh, bearer token authentication. Yeah, what's in the name? So let's fire up uh, Visual Studio Code and let's start coding. Here I created a function called uh, bearer token, which will use this function to create and return our bearer token. The function takes two mandatory parameters, our client ID and our client secret. And here we set up the headers. Uh, in the header we specify that the content type will be application JSON, and in the body we'll pass our client ID and client secret. We use the PowerShell uh, invoke rest method command. And we'll specify the trust URL. Our method is post, and we'll add the body and the headers as well. We'll save everything in a variable called response. And from response, we'll get the bearer token, and we'll return the bearer token as a function. So let's see how this works. Let's run it real quick. There we go. And let's see if we can pass it our uh, justly created uh, client ID and client secret. So here we got the mini variables, and we'll pass these to the get bearer token function. Ah, and there we go. We can also watch a view our bearer token right here with the right host. And here we got a shiny new bearer token. Yay! Let's move on. So now that we got a bear token, let's see if I can use that bear token to retrieve some data. Here again, on line 42, we recreate the header. And this time we'll pass the authorization uh, and our token, and we'll add the customer ID as well. We'll also add the customer ID to the URL we're using. And this time we'll use the invoke rep request. We'll save the result in uh, the variable result. And, oh, well, that was unfortunate. We got an error message. And also, by the way, Citrix, great way to spell authorization here. <sighs> well, the error message said access denied. So look, let's look at our code again, because we probably did something wrong here. Ah, I see where I messed up. Uh, we got the bearer token in the bearer token variable, but somehow I used the token variable when building up the header. Well, we can quickly fix that, and let's see if we can run it again. Hopefully no one will notice this. So, oh crap, it still doesn't work. Oh man, my luck. Invalid bearer token and service key. That sucks. Okay. Well, so after a lot of soul searching and some mind swearing, mind you, uh, I happen to find the error message. If you look at the documentation, which I should have started with, Citrix has a nice space called calling an API using the Citrix Cloud bearer token. And in the documentation, we can see that we need to prefix our bearer token with CWOuth bearer is. What the freak? Well, now that we know what we did wrong here, uh, and when I say we, I mean myself, of course, we can easily fix our code. Let's go back to our token variable. Here, we have prefixed our bearer token with the bearer is string, like we should have from the start. Let's run the scan here and see if when the prefix is actually added to the token. There we go. So, that part went okay. Let's see if we now can finally get some working code here, because my reputation is on the line here. So, let's try it again, third time's a charm. And yes, 
there we go. No error message, which means that everything should have gone okay by now. Whew, good news. So, um, I hear you guys say, guys, um, can we do this in an easier way? Well, I'm very glad you asked because yes, we can. There's an easier way to get the bearer token. Uh, but before that, we need to install something called the Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktops Remote PowerShell SDK. And uh, one small tip, please always download the latest version of the SDK because if you don't, you might run into problems later on. I did, I found that out the hard way. So once we downloaded our software, we can install it here. I'm gonna skip through this a little bit because this is as boring as watching grass grow. So, there we go. So, now let's switch back to our Visual Studio code. Once we installed the SDK, we now first have to import it. And once we import the uh, Citrix modules, we can see with get command that we get a whole bunch of new commands that we can use. Big list. So the one we actually need is the authentication command, which is called get xd authentication. So let's run it real quick. So as we can see, this is a very familiar tab in which we can fill in our Citrix Cloud credentials. So I'm not going to show you guys how I fill in my credentials. You just have to believe me on that. So I'll just stop the recording, fill in my credentials, and here we are authenticated. So once we are authenticated, we can very easily retrieve the bearer token from the global variables. There we go. Same key. Much easier, isn't it? But, as all good things, there is a small caveat uh, for this. Um, and there's one drawback. And the drawback is that uh, we need to authenticate every time we create a new session, uh, which is cumbersome and not something you want in your scripting. So what we can do, instead of using GetXT authentication, we can create an authentication profile. And for that, we can use the commandlet setXD credentials. And with the command setXD credentials, we can pass the customer ID as an argument, and we can pass a secure client file. And this is a file you can download when you create the secure APIs. And it's just a CSV file containing your secret ID and your secret uh, password. I will specify the cloud API, and we'll set says store it as default. And this time we can use it as a default profile. We don't have to run get XD authentication every time we want to start a session. And we can easily retrieve the um, uh, bearer token without much hassle. So let's take a brief here and recap what we've done. We set up API access. We looked at three ways to create a bearer token that we need for authentication to the Citrix Cloud APIs, but we're almost halfway through and we haven't received any actual monitoring data. Uh, yet. So let's switch gears here a little bit. Uh, let's talk about what kind of data we can fetch from the Citrix monitoring database. So all the resources are built up in a logical manner. The URL, which of course stands for Uniform Resource Locator, that we'll be using uh, in this case is customerid.xendesktop.net slash Citrix slash monitor slash odata slash v4 slash data and slash machines. So in this case, we are going to retrieve data on the machines at the VDAs. But we can just as easily also retrieve data on the users. And in this case, we can use the complete URL, just substitute machines for users. Uh, and just like that, we can also, uh, uh, for example, get other data like a data on the machine catalogs, the device catalogs perspective. So, all good? Yeah, great. Let's move on then. So now that we have a bearer token received from whatever method we prefer, we can start to retrieve some data. Yeah, there we go. Again, in line 42, we're gonna set up our headers. And as we said before, in our headers, we'll pass our authorization key and we'll pass the customer ID. We're going to use the URL specified in line 44. And again, we're going to use the invoke web request. 
and pass the URL and the headers as both parameters. Don't forget to add the customer ID in the URL as well. In this case, as we can see, we're going to request some data about the machines, the VDAs in our environment. So let's run this up and see what we got. Good news, we didn't get any error messages, so that's all good. So let's see if we can look at some data. How does it look like? Ah, we got some data, but it's not very nicely formatted. Let's see if we can do something about that. Let's see if we can parse it to a JSON file and see what it looks like then. So, that's much better, right? But I hear you guys say, Elcho, uh, you told a lot about all kinds of definitions, but you didn't talk about JSON. What the hell is JSON? Well, JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation, and it is an open data exchange format that uses key value pairs. It's called JavaScript Object Notation because it was derived from JavaScript. But it's a very common data format, and unlike the name implies, it not, it's not just for JavaScript. Okay, let's move on. So, um, let's move away from PowerShell a little bit. I know it's a developer conference and all, but bear with me for a sec. Let's see if we can also use Excel to retrieve some data. And let's see if we can make it a little bit more readable. So let's get our parent token and let's fire up Excel. So there we go. Um, okay, uh, in Excel, navigate to data and start a new query. And please excuse my Dutch Excel here, by the way. Uh, select other sources and start with an empty query. Once we got the query uh, editor up, let's switch to the advanced editor. Ooh. Here we can paste in the standard template that we can use to access O data from within Excel. Here we got the Power Queries template that we're going to use. Once again, we have our familiar URL here. And in this case, we are going to request some data about the machines as well again. Here, we also add in our authorization header. So let's copy this one in and paste it in. And lastly, we need our customer ID. We can easily copy that from our URL. Once we got it all filled in, click OK and see what we got. Okay, uh, the error message we get here says a user not authorized. So let's look at the query again, because I probably know what I did wrong here. Um, I had multiple text files with the bearer tokens, and I didn't don't think I mentioned this before, but the bearer token is only valid for one hour. So what I did here is I took too long re uh, recording the video, and my bearer token wasn't valid anymore. So let's get the newly created bear token, which should still be valid, and see if that works a little bit better here. So let's go. There you go, Bob Shironko. Everything worked out in the end. So let's give the screen a name. And here we got all the data about our VDAs in a more readable format in Excel. And I know, I know, I know you guys. Uh, I could have just as easily loaded our JSON into Excel if you're wondering about that. But this was more fun, wasn't it? So now that we got some data from Excel, let's try something a little bit more advanced. And for that, we're going to switch out Excel for Power BI. And my apologies because my Power BI is in Dutch again. So once we started Power BI up, uh, just retrieve data. And again, let's select an empty query. Once we got the query editor up, let's again switch to the advanced editor. And paste in our power query, which is exactly the same as the one we used in Excel. Click OK. And here we have a query with our all our VDAs in our environment. But we can make this a little bit more interesting. Let's add another query to the mix. And this time, instead of machines, let's look at the device catalog data. 
So we'll swap out machines for catalogs. So now we got two separate tables here. Um, and now that we got two tables, we should be able to combine these two. There we go. We're going to join two tables. And from the machine, uh, 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 from the machine table, select the catalog ID column. There we go. And let's link that up to the catalog. We use the ID for this. And with this, we can create a so-called left outer joint to aggregate the data from both tables into the machine catalog table. Let's tidy this up a bit and only show the columns we're interested in. Takes a little bit of time. And there we go. So let's run this query and see what we got. So what we have here is we have the machine um, table and we added the catalog names. So in this table we can show the machine names and the corresponding device catalog. So here we look at the graphical representation of the table during we made here, which in essence is a so-called one-to-many relationship. So now do we do this, what else can we do? Well, we can also make some more advanced queries. In this example here, we are fetching all the user sessions for which the logon duration was longer than 10 minutes. And by the way, if you have any, any users with logon sessions more than 10 minutes, please reevaluate your life choices because these users will not be content, I can tell you. So we did that by creating a parameter and the parameter is called filter. And we're going to filter all the sessions that have a logon duration, which is GT600,000. And that means a logon duration which takes longer than one minute, of uh, 10 minutes. So with this example, which is again a little bit more advanced, we can retrieve a list of all the sessions counted up and grouped by connection state. So we're going to use a parameter again, and we're going to say, group by connection state, and we're going to aggregate all the data and count them with the number of sessions. So what else can you do? I'm not really good at creating dashboards, so there are other people who are much, much better at this. Um, so we're reaching the end of the session. I wanted to show you guys some examples of what you can do with OData. This example is actually from uh, Matthias Alfers, who now works for uh, Citrix as an SE, and who used OData and Grafana to create this lovely dashboard. So I done a project a while back where we also used OData and Power BI to create some dashboards for the support organization. Here in this dashboard, we can see the number of filled sessions, the failure count, and a representation of the number of concurrent sessions. We also created an additional dashboard. Uh, to see which machine still had a pending update. But these are just a couple of examples of what you can do by means of dashboards with OData and PowerShell. Uh, and with that, that brings us to the end of the session. Thank you very, very much for watching. And please also do check out my other two sessions I'm presenting here, together with my good friend and colleague Ryan Fervis Bijkerk, in which we'll be exploring the Azure DevOps way of maintaining uh, Citrix micro apps, and we have a session where we'll be talking uh, you guys about everything you ever wanted to know about Python and PowerShell. Furthermore, my other colleagues at RawWorks are also hosting three very interesting sessions, so make sure to check those out as well. Again, guys, thank you very much for watching. Enjoy the rest of the session at City Comforts. Thank you, and take care. Bye-bye.